Okay, this is another little thing that's going to help everybody because you guys that are in engine performance need to know this and the people that are in engine repair need to know this. And so uh, I wanted to um, get everybody acclimated to what some of the terms mean. Like when you hear people talking about bottom dead center, top dead center, understanding how the engines work. We're basically going to go as far as we can through it in the amount of time that we got. Now you see right here on this opening slide, uh, up here would be your cylinder head. That's the piston at top dead center. Now look, you see this little throw right here? Uh, this crankshaft right here, see, has got the throw in the middle is the one, I mean the throw that runs right through the middle of it, that's the one that spins in the main bearings. And these other ones are your rods. Okay, so what you got right here is you got the rod journal and the main journal. And when it when these are directly up like that, the rod, I mean the piston's all the way to the top, and that pist that rod is straight in the middle. You were checking cylinder leakage the other day and you didn't quite have it at top dead center and the air pushed the piston back down. You remember that? Yes, or that you were telling me about that? Yes, you know, all, uh, yeah, so now basically if you got it at top dead center, you got a good uh, nice little trap there. You got a main drill a counterweight. See that counterweight on there? There's all kinds of stuff. And you got your, and this right here is a, it's a half a stroke, basically. Right here, see that? The piston's going to go up and down. See, this a full stroke would be all the way down here, see? So basically the piston's going to travel up and down that much. All right, now this right here is your crankshaft. There's the shaft, just like I held in my hand a while ago. This right here is a harmonic balancer. This thing has basically got two pieces that are put together and there's a pulley on the outside and the part of the inside that goes to the crankshaft and then between them there's rubber. You might even have noticed that. And uh, somewhere over there I've got a balancer that started coming apart. And you can see the, uh, the basically the rubber part that I'm talking about. Of course, here's your time of year. And these bearings right here, these right here be your main bearings. And these bearings are very special pieces of equipment. Yeah, well that ain't one, that's not what I was talking about there. Uh, but anyhow, the uh, this bearing right here goes in a rod. And these right here are the thrust bearings. The thrust bearings are actually in there because when you mash the clutch or when the torque converter swells up a little bit when you're giving it some gas, it's got to push the it's going to push the crankshaft forward. And you know, anything that's keeping the crankshaft from moving front and rear, you're going to have the thrust bearing. You've only got one set of thrust bearings on there. That's all there is to it. Sometimes you'll just have one on the top or on the, you know, or down in the block. Sometimes it's built onto the, these main bearings. You'll have one main bearing, it's got thrust bearing sleeves on it. But anyway, now this is the block. A hole for each piston, all galleries, coolant system jacket, bearing saddles for crankshaft and camshaft. A lot of people, when they got an old engine that they're rebuilding and everything, they're going to clean it all up. They don't think about taking the little pipe plugs out of all of the oil galleries and cleaning those out, and a lot of that crud comes out of there and it winds up in trouble. You know, lot, you know the people that are really serious about doing heavy-duty engine stuff, the best thing to clean a cast iron engine block is soap and water. And when you're honing the cylinders, like if you don't put rings in it and you're not going to bore it, clean it out with soap and water. You know, you don't use, you know, chemicals or oil or brake parts cleaner and all that. Like soap and water works better than anything else you can use on that. Just remember that. Uh, of course, after you get through the soap and water, you'll blow it off there, you know, so it don't start rusting anything. But bearing saddles for crankshaft and cam shaft right here. Uh, okay, so the crankshaft run spins in here, and the cam shaft runs in this hole right here. And of course, you've got one uh, cylinder for each, I mean, one hole for each piston. Now your pistons, those are pretty pistons, aren't they? You like that? Oh yeah. Yeah, Federal Mogul. And uh, you got the, these right here are your oil separator rings, the scrapers, and then you got two compression rings. That's the way most of them are set up. Some of the diesels will have uh, a ring above and below the wrist pin. Uh, the wrist pin actually goes through there, and they call it the wrist pin because it's where the piston does its thing. And those pistons have a front and a rear. You can't just put the piston in there either way. And the, typically the piston will have, on the top of it, it'll have a notch. You see how this piston's got a notch on it? That's the front. You also might notice that if you look really close, that wrist pin hole is not in the center, it's off to the side. And one time, this is a war story for the YouTube people that love my war story so much. Uh, you may have even heard me tell this one before. I built a Volkswagen engine. I was building a lot of engines at the time. My dad had a Volkswagen shop. But it had been years since I built a Volkswagen bug engine. And so I was, I put all those arrows pointing toward the belt, right? I'm, which I'm thinking the belts be in the front, you know what I'm saying? But the flywheel is front of a Volkswagen. When I got it built up, it ran really good, 
but it was make it had a little knock to it, and um, it had all the power you never wanted a little rail buggy, and you had nothing to jerk the wheel off the ground three feet when you went to take off. It was just really powerful. I called my dad and said, "Why is this thing knocking?" He said, uh, "You put the pistons in there backwards." Really? Oh crap! You're right. They're supposed to point quarter flywheel. So I pulled it back down, put the pistons back together, so it pointed. The knock went away, but it didn't have near as much power. <laughs> and he told me, he says, if you can stand to listen to that knock until it comes apart, you'll outrun the stew out of somebody that built one right. <laughs> so this is the way they do. He's done that before too, I guess. But it's egg-shaped lobes on your camshaft. Open the valves. The camshaft's got a lot to do with how the engine breathes. Now you know about lift and duration. Lift is how high the valves open. Duration is how long it stays open. You got it. Okay, now these right here are roller lifter, and these are push rods. And that camshaft goes right in there. This is an old V8, you know, old school V8, you know, usually for training purposes, I talk about them. And so you always got to watch that for these cam loads like to round off. And uh, there was another little uh, story there. This guy had a 4.8 and a 06 Chevy pickup we worked on, and he was saying it doesn't quite seem to have the power it used to have. And so I drove it, and you know, if you're not used to driving a truck, if it ain't skipping or nothing, you don't really feel anything. You know, it's like he couldn't really put his finger on it. He said it's just not as strong as it used to be. And so we were had it running over and we were checking it and all. It wasn't even recording any misfires, as I remember. But one of the guys says, you know, I hear a little activity under this valve cover over here. So we pulled it off. We put a dial indicator on top of the push rod and we turned it through. And it was supposed to have two and a quarter inches of lift. And I don't remember what the exact numbers were. But anyway, it, it, it was, uh, you could tell by watching that thing go up down that the push rod, I mean, that the camshaft would wore out. And that thing had worn lobes off. If the cam load wears completely off, when you crank it up, it'll sound like a machine gun firing out the intake. Boop, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. So we've got to have to fool with those before, too. There's your base circle and load lift. Now you can measure on a camshaft, if you measure that base circle from here to here with your micrometer, and then you measure from here to here, and you take those two numbers, you can figure out what the lift is. Now, basically, it's not on, on the ones that have push rods, since the push rod goes up to the, you know, the push, the, the push rod is not a perfect teeter-totter. It's actually shorter on the uh, one side than it is on the other. So the lift on that may lift the valve higher than that because of the way the push rod's fulcrum and all that. Just be aware of that. Here's something else that you know, I want to tell you, and I want you to ever forget this. Watch this really close. Whenever you're putting cam bearings in an engine block, you know, there's a tool out there we got to do that with, you better pay attention to those cam bearings because some engines has different size cam bearings as you go. You got that? They won't all be the same. All of them, all of them look just alike. But the perfect circle numbers there sequentially. If you put the wrong one in the wrong place, you got issues. Because the love, these, uh, on, and it's true on every camshaft, but on some of them you're going to see different size, you know, stepping down as you go. All right, so just keep about that. There's your load. This is the lobe. This is the egg-shaped lobe right there, like I was talking about. All right, now here's how the eggs line up. Whenever you're looking at the eggs on the uh, camshaft, you're basically going to see your intake lobe center line, and you notice there's some overlap between that. Your exhaust closes, your intake opens right here, and they, there's a there's a amount of time when the intake on, on most engines when the intake and the exhaust valves are open at the same time, very briefly. And the reason that's there is because when you're at the top of that exhaust stroke, you're going to open you know, the pistons up here. There ain't much space in there anyway. You're going to let some uh, clean you know, air mix come in there and purge the rest of the old exhaust mix. And if you got one that's not set up like that, it'll have some misfires that I love, 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 and they want it to run smooth. So they let that, during that overlap, and you can find, if you find the place like let's say that you know we're going to talk about companion, companion cylinders in a minute. If you find the overlap, that's top dead center exhaust. When both the valves are open together, but when both the valves are closed in a piston of TDC. But overlap is going to, if you got both valves open at the same time, you're really, really, really close to top dead center on exhaust on that cylinder. Just remember that. All right, so valve timing, and belts are chain. Now the chains have got to be lubricated. Um, now, I, there's one engine I know about that's got a belt that's lubricated, but that's totally out off the pail. I don't even remember which one it is, but I remember studying about it a while back. Anyway, the point of the matter is it's one of these newer ones. Uh, belts, you just run them shafts out through the end, put them in a plastic cover, 
and it spins all of that, and you don't have to lubricate nothing. Nothing. You just have to have seals behind all these shafts where it's coming out of the engine. On your timing chains, even you know the ones with the sliders and all that, you're basically you're, they got to be lubricated. They got to have oil going into them. And here's another thing I told y'all last week: if you've got overhead cam, there's going to be a pressurized oil passage going through the head gasket up there to lubricate the cam shaft. Keep that in mind too. All right. Heads and valves. These are three valve heads off the Ford. The heads need cooling more than any part of the engine. The head is the hottest running part. That's why on a lot of these vehicles now you'll see that they have a cylinder head temperature sensor. And on your Ford vehicles, when the engine gets low, the one that says Triton on the side of it, when the engine gets to a certain temperature, like if it detects the engine's running too hot, it shuts off the, I mean, the explosions, the, you know, uh, combustion in every other cylinder, and it uses them just to pump air to keep it cool. And then it'll switch, you know, to, to keep it save the engine. And I've seen them save that. Now, you can defeat that and keep driving it and mess it up even when it's doing that, but it'll take you a lot farther. Now we're going to build an old school V8. And you guys have to watch us build this V8 now. We're going to do this right here. We're going to start this video. We can build that here. We're going to build it right here. Right here on the screen. There's the green cap. There's the main caps. Look at the four volt main. All right. See that crank shaft turning? Incidentally, when you get it bolted in without that, you ought to be able to slap that camshaft and turn it pretty easy. All right. Now we're going to turn it over. And see all them rods, pistons, camshaft up there? These are, right here, are your push rods that are sticking up there. And put a timing chain on it, double roller chain. And put the cover on there. There'll be a seal right there. There's our oil can. There's the oil filter. Let's tighten it up, hand tight. And there's your valves, your springs, your rocker arms. See how that's in there? We zoomed in on that so you can see that. All right, there's your valve covers and your heads. Intake manifold, thermostat housing. Fuel rail, intake plenum, there's a distributor back there. Throttle plates, got to run that through there. Ta da, the harmonic balancer, water pump. It doesn't seem like a whole lot of parts. Not really. Now we left the, uh, the camshaft is not showing in there, and there's actually a plug in the back. Uh, but there you go. Uh, what do you think about that? Are you happy with that? Yeah. It didn't show. It didn't show the um, the gaskets or anything. Yeah, I just showed it. Just showed the parts. That was something somebody did with the 3D thing. All right, now we're gonna now we're gonna build one a little bit faster. And this one here is a four cylinder. Except I didn't mean to do that. Let me back up. We're gonna go right here. All right, let's build this four cylinder really swift. Where did I stop it? I think what happened was, I, instead of a WMV file, I put an MPG file in there, and it's making me, it's giving me a trouble. Uh, we're not going to be able to do that one. But we can watch this go. All right, an engine that's running right is a well-oiled machine. It's basically, you got all this pressurized lube oil going to the crankshaft. And there's your, watch these strokes now. Intake, compression, power, exhaust. Intake, compression, power, and exhaust. All right, the oxygen and the hydrocarbons, under ignition create superheat over 2,000 degrees per firing event, and that causes the inert nitrogen to expand. See, the heat of the burn expands the nitrogen, and that's what pushes the piston down. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay, nitrogen's inert, and 78% of what goes in there is nitrogen. And most of us, can you call that the working fluid? One guy that I know calls it that. All right, drives the flywheel, bolted to the torque converter, delivers power to the transmission over the other wheels. You see that thing working? And there's your piston going up and down. You see your valve with these little stellite seats. They do another. That's a hardened metal seat that's in there. And I, and I thought you guys would appreciate seeing that. Okay, I think I can go this way. All right, you see, watch the fuel spray in there. See the fuel? See the fuel injector right here? Watch that fuel spray in there. And then it opens up and it pulls it in and it squeezes it. Now, direct injection engines actually spray it directly into the cylinder. But that's another, that's another story. All right. When an engine starts, the injectors double pulse to wet the manifold, and the sparks happening barely before top dead center. So basically, as, as, as you're looking at the front of the engine, you're standing looking at the front of the engine, it's probably turning this way, right? Okay, and this is how many, you've got to get a notion in your head for how many degrees is what. You know, so basically, if you go over here, 120 degrees is right here. If you go to three, draw 320 degree things, 
like on a six cylinder, you basically got three pieces of a pie. That's what that amounts to. This right here is a nice little thing. Uh, gives you the, how you know how many degrees of crankshaft revolution is going on when all this is happening. See at bottom dead center, you got all this you know this activity there. And it, you could talk about that for a long time. But six degrees advance, top dead center, six degrees retarded. You see that? If the spark is happening after top dead center, you're going to have a really sluggish running engine. If the timing is too fast, you might remember the Mazda we worked on the other day that was bucking and jumping and cutting up, and when we set the timing like it was supposed to be, it ran really well. You remember that? And somebody had dropped the distributor in it and just figured if they got it running, whoopee, it's running, you know. But they didn't actually pull the spout connector on it and set the timing, and we put the timing on 10 degrees, and it ran like a brand new truck. And then the transmission went out. So now we got the transmission. All right, now think about this. How many of you guys have used a protractor for angles? Think of a protractor, except one that goes all the way around. 90 degrees, 180 degrees, and you can follow it all around. You see, there's 120 degrees right there. So 120 degrees is twice what? What's, what's half of 120 degrees? 60 degrees. So if you turn that far, then you turn that far more. All right, now then. And no load idle, the ignition spark coming hovers around 10 to 15 degrees before top dead center. That's what's going to happen. As the engine speed increases, the gas can only burn so fast, and so it has to light off sooner to give it the maximum power that you need. But when you're pulling, when you're in a situation where you're pulling, the timing is actually retarded so that it won't detonate. Detonation means that the spark happens when the piston's coming up and before it needs to, and the spark, the pressure actually hits the top of the piston while it's coming up and it makes a ping noise. You might have heard a labor knock or a ping or a detonation. And it can happen for various different reasons. If you burn premium fuel in a vehicle that's set up for regular fuel, premium fuel burns slower. And because it burns slower, it leaves some in there. And as it leaves some in there, it cakes up on the cylinder head on top of the piston. It takes up room in the combustion chamber, and it makes the pressure too high. It actually raises compression, and it makes it where you wind up with pinging and labor knocking all the time. All right. Now, this right here is not exactly accurate, but they, they're showing that to be 90 degrees, but this is not 90 degrees, you know, it'll be straight out the side, and so on and so forth. But right here is where your spark happens. And the pressure increases dramatically right there. If there was no spark, you'd only see about this much pressure. You see that? They're basically drawing that. Timing adjustments aren't done on any engine with a crankshaft sensor. That would be like on the white Chevy out there, they got a CSFI ignition system. It's got a distributor. But turning the distributor on that one does not set the timing like it does on a 350 Chevrolet. That's no. like a, uh, there's a Mercedes that a teacher at our school has, and mm -hmm. it has a sensor. Yep. And like originally, it wouldn't crank, and then they thought it was the same. Those Mr. Briggs, or Mr. Briggs, and we changed the sensor out, and then it ran for a little bit, then it stopped cranking, then put the old one back in it, and then it started working again. So I guess it might be set itself or something. Well, what we did on the Mercedes, well, it was actually their crossfire here. We put a crank sensor on it because it would get hot and the crank sensor would open up. Yeah. And the one the sensor we put in there had, the one that came out of it had 1,050 ohms. The one we put back in had 1,350. It was the Intermotor brand. Yeah. I'm sorry, Intermotor, but this is the way it was. Uh, so what we had was they had 1,300 ohms on that one, and it might start and it might not. So I called them. It's only another Intermotor that had 1,200 ohms, and it might start and it might not. And so I got a, a Mercedes sensor, Bosch actually, put it in there with about 1,050 ohms like it's supposed to. You've been driving it ever since. It runs like a sewing machine. But the fact is, if you buy an aftermarket sensor, measure the ohms. And on this one here, you could take the sensor and put it in the vise, heat it up, and it would, uh, and you have your ohmmeter on it, and it would suddenly really lose its uh, continuity. And that, that was why I was quitting going down the road on hers. Yeah, we measured the ohms on both of them. I don't remember what they are by heart. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, but, uh, I don't know why I always remember those ohms, but I do. You know, anyway, long and short of it is. Yeah. So the no, the knowing the firing order is really important. If you know the firing order, you can figure it out the companion cylinders. Knowing the companion cylinders is important too if you're doing some heavy duty engine work. You can draw an imaginary distributor. If the firing order is 18726543, and basically if you draw your distributor on a piece of paper, 18726543, and the one directly across from eight is going to be its companion. Got that? That ain't complicated, is it? 1, 8, 7, 2, 6, 5, 4, 3. All right, 1 and 6, 2 and 3 and 2, 4 and 7 on this particular one. Now, you know, on the 1, 3, 7, 2, 6, 5, 4, 8 ones, like on your Mustangs and your 5, 8s and all, 
they're going to have different companion cell numbers, one eight four three six five seven two, and these other ones. All right, so you got that. Now that this works on a V six, a four cylinder, whatever. Four cylinders and straight sixes are easy to figure out. You know, one and six. You know, two and five, three and four. Uh, so sort of you can also draw a line down the middle of the firing order, A B C D. That one and that one will be companions. That one and that one will be companions. That one and that one. That one. You know, you can do it that way too. There's a couple of different ways you can do it. Um, but anyway, to determine how many degrees apart firing events are, you divide 720 to crankshaft revolutions by the number of cylinders. So if it's an eight cylinder, it's 90 degrees between firing events. And the companion cylinder to the one that's firing is going to be on exhaust at this point. You got it? On that where the crankshaft is there. All right, 180 degrees on four cylinder, 120 degrees on six cylinder. All right, loss of compression can be determined by setting the suspect cylinder on top dead center, compression stroke with both valve closed, piston at top dead, crank in the center, which is what this is. Intake, <coughs> put air in the spark plug hole. Listen for where it's getting out of there. Intake valve, exhaust valve, crank case, piston or ring, bubbles in a radiator, be a head gasket, adjacent cylinder, because they blow between cylinders sometimes. We had a three liter Taurus with low compression on cylinder number one. 14, 25, 36 was the, was the firing order. We pulled all the spark plug and got the number one cylinder on top dead center by making sure the companion, which was number five, was on exhaust. So if you turn it over and so you got the little timing mark lined up, which the timing mark's going to be lined up on the crank if you're on, you know, the uh, one and five, the, you know, one and its companion, that's the only time that mark comes around. We lined that one up, we checked five, sure enough, it wasn't missing. It was on exhaust, so we knew number one had to be on compression. We put smoke in there, and it came out of the number three hole. So we put smoke in the number one hole when all the valves should have been closed, and it came out of the number three hole. What did that mean? The valve's been or something? Well, which valve, though? It's open. Huh? The third one. Is it third one? <laughs> the third one? Okay, I'm not even going to talk about that. you got to know the fire bird. You got to know what stroke three is on when number one's at top dead center compression. All right, so if three's firing event happens two cylinders before one, so the crank's turned 240 degrees. All right, right here, right here, right here. Three is right here. The exhaust stroke. So exhaust valve's open on three, so that means it's going past the exhaust valve on one and coming out three. You got it? We're making its way through the exhaust system on that. That's how we found that, but that wasn't a big deal. That was an experiment. I was just horsing around with that. But with this knowledge, we determined the number three exhaust valve was open, so the exhaust valve on number one was compromised. Now, here's another one. We're almost through here. 88 Honda CRX. This is a good story. All right, he crashes his CRX, but he just has had the motor redone. And so he brings it to us. He buys a good CRX with a bad engine. Our task is to take the good engine and put it in the bad car. It gets better. All right. So, we got this thing right. We decided we are going to check the bad engine. There's no compression on number four. None whatsoever. The engine spins over. And there's compression on one, two, and three, but nothing on number four. Everybody got that? We're on the same sheet of music? Okay. The engine sounds fairly normal spinning over. Picks up speed on the one compression stroke. Incidentally, if you hear an engine spinning over, it goes, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, so that engine's got low compression on one cylinder. You can know that right to start with, right? Now, if it's sounding even on all cylinders, you can know that it doesn't have low compression on one cylinder. Uh, we do a cylinder leakage test and find no cylinder leakage on cylinder what? No cylinder leakage on cylinder number four, yet it has no compression? That drive you crazy thinking about that? Yeah, a little bit. No cylinder leakage? To remind me before we're done, and I'll tell you what was wrong. And you know, what got me was, I was, I was, we were checking this thing, and, okay, we're going to check this thing over here, and I'm over here being the instructor, see? And I say, let's see where this, we're going to see where that horse going. How come they got no compression? No cylinder leakage. We had our cylinder leakage tester on there. None. Okay. Hmm. Students were all looking at me. I said, well, we're going to pull the motor out anyway. Let's just go ahead and get it out. <laughs> I didn't have a clue what was going on. I mean, if you think about it, you can come up with what the deal was. But it's so unusual for that to happen. All right. Now, and I'll tell you before we're through here. All right. These two engines had two different kinds of fuel injection. So the manifold... On the engine that we were, that was in the car we were changing it into, was basically one of these with this throttle body injection and all that, and the other one was multi-point fuel injection. Is this a problem? We've got an engine that's got MFI on it, and we got an engine that's got TBI on it. Two different injection systems, two different wire harnesses, two different engine controllers. What are you gonna do about that? Not much. 
We did. <laughs> My students were all saying, well, I got to pull the wire harness and the engine controller and all this. Nah, you don't fool with all that mess. And they don't point in it. So what we did was, we stripped it down to a short block. I mean a long block. I'm sorry, not a short block. This is a long block. A long block has got the head on it. It's the whole engine basically, except, you know, in most cases it won't have a, that, that the valve cover and the that on it. The short block has got nothing but a piston and a crank in it. And one time there was a guy at the Ford place came walking out, me and one of the truck mechanics were standing there talking to another. He goes, I was going to put an engine in my wife's van, and they asked me a question I don't know how to answer in here. And I said, what's the question? She said, they asked me if it had a long block or a short block in it, and I don't know. They were asking him if he wanted to buy a long block or a short block. And he didn't know how to answer that question because he didn't know the difference. And the truck mechanic looked at me and he goes, I'm going to let you answer this one. And he walked off, you know. All right. This is a short block and a long block on the V8s. Notice you got your heads, everything, that timing chain, all that. And this one here is a short block. So you pretty much just be buying what you need. Huh? You just be buying what you need if everything else is. Yeah, basically your heads are good or you don't want to change the heads or something like that. You know, but uh, a lot of the times the long block, well, the long block won't usually have a manifold on it, but it won't be set up like this right here and it costs more. Uh, and that's a pretty good deal. But what was going on with the Honda, the reason they didn't have any compression on cylinder number four was apparently somebody had been wrapping it up and it, uh, the rod on number four came loose from the crankshaft, knocked the hole in the side of the block, and, and the crankshaft beat it off of there and threw it out and it got away. And the piston was at the bottom of the cylinder with only about that much rod still connected to it and it wasn't moving. So when we put the pressure in there, the piston was holding air really good, but it wasn't going nowhere. It wasn't going to squeeze any air if it wasn't moving. And after we took it apart and saw what was going on, I was like, oh, I can't believe this, you know. But initially it was like counterintuitive. How can it not have any compression and not have any co any uh, yeah, compression? See it, any, yeah. yeah, it didn't have any leakage, but it also didn't have any compression. If the piston's not moving, it's not going to have any. You got that? Can All right. have no airflow on it? Well, there, I mean, airflow wasn't going to read compression when you're checking compression and it's supposed to be bouncing up around, you know, 200 pounds or 160 pounds.